Just a few months ago, most sensible people thought that the lab leak hypothesis for COVID-19 was a wild-eyed conspiracy theory. But now it's open for grown-up investigation and a huge amount has been written and spoken about it over the last couple of months. What have we learned? Well, it turns out quite a lot and some of it is deeply unsavoury. Well, let's take a look. Reportedly, the possibility of a Wuhan lab leak origin for the COVID-19 virus was discussed at the G7 summit in Cornwall a couple of days ago. Another indication that the theory seemed to be growing in credence, although the opinions of the various nations present were said to have been mixed. Well, this is progress, because until recently, even discussing the possibility put you in the territory of wild-eyed conspiracy theorists, which was the world into which I put my first video on the topic four months ago. So let's recap the possible scenario as I mapped out in that earlier video. And remember, there's no proof for any version of how COVID-19 emerged. But when it came to the lab leak hypothesis, there were people seeking to shut down discussion of it, saying it was out of the question. All I was doing in that first video was saying, well, hang on, because there's real credible evidence here that we need to talk about. All right, six miners working in a bat cave in Yunnan province in China were infected by a virus developing symptoms similar to COVID-19. Viral samples from that cave, the Mojiang mine, were collected and taken to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The Wuhan Institute carried out what's called gain-of-function research on these and probably a range of other samples. There's been no public disclosure on exactly what was being studied and how. When SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, emerged, it turned out that its nearest relative was RATG13, which, after some external sleuthing, it turned out had come from the Mojiang mine. But the link hadn't initially been admitted by the director of the WIV, Xi Zhengli, so the question arose of whether there were other undisclosed strains. In very short order, two highly influential pieces were published in peer-reviewed journals Nature and The Lancet. They effectively ruled out the idea that the virus had been manipulated in a lab or that there had been a lab leak. And from that point on, there was little mainstream interest in the topic. Social media platforms treated content on the subject as toxic until all that changed after Trump had finished his term as president. But the question started to be raised nonetheless by researchers. How come SARS-CoV-2 had appeared already extremely well adapted for human-to-human -human transmission? Because in the rare instances when a virus jumps from a bat to a human, they are generally not well suited to their new host, so they have to go through a period of rapid evolution to gain the ability to infect human-to-human. -human. Which is probably one reason why those six miners who became infected from the bat cave did not become the start of a wider infection incident. But so far as we can tell, SARS-CoV-2 arrived already extremely well adapted from day one. Now that could be because it spent time in a third unknown animal host, or it could be that it was in human circulation undetected in a milder form. But no evidence has been found to support either of those two so far. Or it could have been developed in the lab to have that specific quality. And for some, that's currently the most persuasive argument. So that's for recap. You can watch the original video for details. It's still current as far as I can see. In this video, we'll look at what we've now learned about the politics of the institutions, the journals and even the government in that initial process of shutting down the debate. Because the truth is, there is little new science over the last few months that has presented breakthroughs. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal that claimed that the existence of the double CGG signature in the genetic code was certain proof of genetic manipulation. That claim doesn't seem to be well supported, for all that it's now echoing around the internet in the way you would expect. There was a study in November last year that stated that the genetic code did not rule out lab manipulation, and that seems to remain the safest position. But there have been numerous revelations around the politics. Some of this has come from more careful scrutiny of the Anthony Fauci emails that were released under a Freedom of Information request. 
and some has come from a critical look at the role of a couple of those top scientific journals with implications that really go to the heart of the entire scientific community. First of all, there's the story of how the messages first went out, discouraging anyone from taking the idea of the lab leak seriously. Early in the outbreak, we had one email sent to Dr. Anthony Fauci at 10.30 in the evening on January the 31st from one Christian G. Anderson, a professor in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology at Scripps Research. This was in response to Fauci having shared an article from the journal Science that initially looked at the potential origins of the virus and raised the question whether it might have come from the lab. Anderson and his team had clearly seen some unusual features in the genome sequencing. On a phylogenetic tree, the virus looks totally normal and the close clustering with bats suggests that bats serve as the reservoir. The unusual features of a virus make up a really small part of the genome, less than 0.1%, so one has to look really closely at all the sequences to see that some of the features potentially look engineered. We have a good team lined up to look very critically at this, so we should know much more at the end of the weekend. I should mention that after discussions earlier today, Eddie, Bob, Mike and myself all find the genome inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory. But we have to look at this much more closely and there are still further analyses to be done, so those opinions could still change. Now on its own, that's not conclusive. It just shows there was a discussion and speculation. Some people saw it and said, see, see, Fauci knew. But it's entirely possible that when the question was asked and then dismissed on closer investigation, we just don't know. But it's interesting what happened next, because by the afternoon of the very next day after that email, a conference call discussion was arranged for that day with a group of people, including Christian Anderson and a few other individuals, amongst others, Bob Gary, Andrew Rambau and Eddie Holmes. Remember the names. Now we don't know what they discussed, but we do know that 15 days after that conversation, the letter of the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2 was uploaded as a preprint to the virological website before being published in Nature Medicine a month later. The authors of that letter were Christian Anderson and Bob Gary, Andrew Rambau and Eddie Holmes, plus one other. So one presumes the agreement to produce that paper came from that meeting. And this was a thing. On January the 31st, Christian Anderson was talking about possible signs that COVID-19 had been manipulated. Within two weeks, he would produced a paper that had the effect of ruling that out. It was one of two hugely influential papers that sent that message very early on. Our analyses clearly show that SARS-CoV-2 is not a laboratory construct or a purposefully manipulated virus. So there'd evidently been a fairly rapid turnaround. Maybe all that came from that closer examination, but weirdly, a Twitter exchange came to light where in response to Senator Tom Cotton, who tweeted this, we still don't know where coronavirus originated, could have been a market, a farm, a food processing company. I would note that Wuhan has China's only biosafety level four super laboratory that works with the world's most deadly pathogens to include, yes, coronavirus. Which seems relatively restrained and factual, Christian Anderson tweeted this response. Thanks for looping me in, Tara. I only had a quick look at the link, but the analyses are completely flawed and wrong. They can be safely ignored. The puzzling thing is that that tweet was sent on January the 31st, 2020. In other words, the very same day we've now seen that he sent an email to Dr. Fauci saying that the virus might show signs of manipulation. Once the Fauci emails were released, Anderson was quickly quizzed by Twitter sleuths and the tweets in question were quickly deleted. When he was challenged on that, he claimed that his Twitter account was set up to auto-delete old tweets. But that didn't seem consistent with how the deletions had been done. And he was again challenged with the detail that seemed to contradict that story. And at that point, Christian G. Anderson simply deleted his Twitter account. Gone. 
So it seems not to be a stretch to suggest that here was de facto evidence of scientists who at the time they believed that manipulation might have been involved had a clear wish to publicly quell any suggestion that such manipulation was possible. And that then turned into this paper that became highly influential in slamming the door shut on serious consideration of the possibility. In recent months, the logic of that paper has been attacked as weak. Here's a relevant passage. It is improbable that SARS-CoV-2 emerged through laboratory manipulation of a related SARS-CoV-like coronavirus. As noted above, the RBD of SARS-CoV-2 is optimised for binding to human ACE2 with an efficient solution different to those previously predicted. Furthermore, if genetic manipulation had been performed, one of the several reverse genetic systems available for beta coronaviruses would probably have been used. However, the genetic data irrefutably show that SARS-CoV-2 is not derived from any previously used virus backbone. So first of all note that whereas the statement in the summary was unequivocal, ruling out any possibility of lab manipulation in the body of the article, it's demoted that to improbable. His argument hinges on assumptions about technology that might have been used. A previously known system would probably have been used. While well, people have observed that you can't definitely rule something out and then use a weak explanation dominated by the word probably. Critics suggest that the letter ignored the capabilities of modern techniques, specifically that of directed evolution. Now, whether those criticisms have validity or not, I don't pretend to be in a position to say. I am not an expert in this field. What does seem incontestably documented is that the principal author was saying one thing in private and another thing in public just two weeks before it was submitted. Which is odd. The second paper that was published was the letter signed by 27 scientists that I discussed also in the previous video, which was coordinated by Peter Dashak, a scientist who worked directly with the Wuhan Institute of Virology on gain-of-function research on bat coronaviruses. That letter was published by The Lancet, and it didn't declare any interest in spite of the glaring conflict of interest that Peter Dashak had. And notice the emphasis in the title of that letter. Statement in support of the scientists, public health professionals and medical professionals of China combating COVID-19. This wasn't a neutral scientific letter about viral origins. It was a statement in support of Chinese professionals. Between the two letters, any critical inquiry into the possibility of a lab leak was effectively shut down, consigned to the conspiracy theory box. Not everybody had as much good fortune getting so quickly published in the mainstream journals. In early January, one group of 14 experts submitted a letter to The Lancet arguing that the natural origin is not supported by conclusive arguments and that a lab origin cannot be formally discarded. The Lancet rejected that article. When they were queried, they were told that it would now be evaluated by a special committee on the virus origins. A committee chaired by... Peter Dashak, whose paper their letter was actually rebutting. They pointed out this might be a conflict of interest. They then got a terse note from the editor, Richard Horton, saying that they just weren't interested. What was really going on? Well, we don't know. However, some have suggested, but it's highly significant, that the Dashak letter was framed in terms of support for China. The Lancet editor Richard Horton has had numerous ties with China and it has been lavishly spending on sponsoring open access journals published by the owner of The Lancet. Richard Horton was even awarded Friendship Award by the government of China in 2015. And we've seen numerous instances where China expects fulsome support in public from those who reap the benefits of its largesse. Richard Horton does seem to have delivered. For instance, in the Guardian newspaper on the 3rd of August 2020, he wrote this. But the scale of the anti-China reaction is disproportionate to the reality of the courageous contributions made by Chinese scientists to our global understanding of this pandemic. It was Chinese scientists who first described the human threat of this new disease on 24th January. It was Chinese scientists who first documented person-to-person -person transmission. It was Chinese scientists who first sequenced the genome of the virus. It was Chinese scientists who called attention to the importance of scaling up access to personal protective equipment, testing and quarantine. 
and it was Chinese scientists who warned of the threat of a pandemic. Some have certainly found the case against Horton to be persuasive. Science author Jamie Metzl tweeted this, I'm not a flamethrower, but the underlying case supporting my call for the Lancet editor Richard Horton to step down are outlined in this important post. The goal of scientific journals must be to foster credible inquiry, not stifle it. It's worth noting that Horton has attracted comment numerous times in recent years for his radical stances. He's a friend of Extinction Rebellion's Rupert Reed. He's been heavily into the extreme end of climate change messaging. And under his watch, The Lancet published the discredited anti-vaxxer paper by Andrew Wakefield, alleging that the MMR vaccine caused autism. But the journal Nature also came in for serious criticism. Around the same time as Peter Daszak's letter was printed in The Lancet, a statement started appearing at the top of some older published papers on gain-of-function research in Nature, including key ones by Ralph Barrick and Shi Zheng Li, saying that the papers were being used as the basis for unverified theories that the novel coronavirus causing COVID-19 was engineered. There is no evidence that this is true. Scientists believe that an animal is the most likely source of the coronavirus. Two days after admitting that there was human transmission of the virus, China highlighted the view that animals sold at the Huanan seafood market were to blame. Within weeks of that statement, four manuscripts describing a pangolin virus with similarities to SARS-CoV-2 were submitted to journals. Two of these were run by Nature, and they sparked global discussion over the role of pangolins as a likely transmission vector, but it was a false trail. A paper was submitted to Nature showing how all four papers primarily used samples from the same batch of pangolins and that the data was inaccurately reported in two. That paper was rejected by Nature. Professor of Chemical Biology at Rutgers University Richard Ebright said that this was a massive issue. Nature and The Lancet played important roles in enabling, encouraging and enforcing the false narrative that science evidence indicates SARS-CoV-2 had a natural spillover origin points and the false narrative that this was a science consensus. Four years previously, the Financial Times had revealed that the publisher of Nature, Springer Nature, was blocking access in China to hundreds of academic articles mentioning subjects that Beijing felt should be censored. There were thought to be 49 sponsorship agreements with Chinese institutions, worth at least $10 million per year. New things we've learned about China. There has been further confirmation that the WIV was indeed carrying out that gain-of-function research that could have directly led to a virus like SARS-CoV-2. We already knew that they'd worked with American researcher Ralph Barrick, who had developed genetically altered mice with human signature cells. He first talked about humanised mice in his paper in 2005 and that such mice could develop coronavirus respiratory disease. In 2018, he produced this paper talking about emergent human coronaviruses in mice. In 2018, there was a research grant awarded to the Wuhan Institute with this title, Pathogenicity of Two New Bat SARS-Related Coronaviruses to Transgenic Mice Expressing Human ACE2. So you don't have to believe in secret hidden research because it is right there. What we don't know, however, is what those two new bat coronaviruses actually were. We also know, of course, that as soon as COVID-19 appeared, the Chinese authorities shut down all access and aggressively tried to control the narrative around the origin of the virus. Which isn't a surprise. I mean, there would be huge geopolitical repercussions if it turned out that China created this virus or even simply were responsible for its accidental release. It's worth noting as well that the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the PLA, were involved in the development and construction of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So we should probably assume a connection between the PLA and the WIV, although the evidence seems very much against there having been a direct link with the work on bat coronaviruses. After Covid emerged, PLA Major General Chen Wei was put in charge of containment efforts in Wuhan, including supervision of the WIV. General Chen is China's top biological weapons expert. 
Some also noticed that on February the 14th, China's President Xi Jinping announced a plan to fast-track a new biosecurity law to tighten safety procedures throughout the country's laboratories. Was that because they knew something they weren't telling? Maybe. To be fair, under the circumstances, it might have occurred to China's leadership that this would be a good thing to do, even in the absence of proof that something had specifically gone wrong. And they wouldn't have been the first to notice. US embassy officials raised concerns about WIV's lab safety in 2018 after a visit there and an interview with Xi Zhengli. One thing I've seen that I've not been able to verify so far, it suggested that the National Natural Science Foundation of China was providing funding in the region of $2 million for research into the origin of the SARS-1 virus. There are three separate studies ongoing, but puzzlingly, Given the huge imperatives you'd expect on finding the intermediary host to show that the virus came from nature, the Foundation's fund, mobilised for that purpose, is zero. So the argument, attributed to retired New York professor Zhan Kang, goes up the Chinese state is not putting resources into looking for the Covid origins, because it already knows there's nothing to find. Well, that's interesting. Park it in the back of a memory to note what else might emerge later on a similar theme. But it is highly speculative. It could well be that in the short term, high priority situation, the Chinese government has simply mobilised other resources for that very purpose. The WIV director, Xi Zhengli, has dismissed any such stories, said that the WIV had no virus samples that are close matches to SARS-CoV-2, has no military involvement or interference, if it was shown that she was lying about any aspect of this, then it would push the door wide open. If what she says has validity, then that kind of slams it shut. There's no evidence either way, but the US State Department's fact sheet published in January said that the Institute was carrying out classified military research. One former State Department official told Vanity Fair it speaks to the honesty and credibility of the WIV that they kept this secret. You have a web of lies, coercion and disinformation that is killing people. So that's to do with the Chinese reactions. But let's just go back to that Vanity Fair piece, which was a publication last week of a month-long investigation. They said that they'd been told that the US investigation into COVID-19's origins had been hampered at every stage by conflicts of interest. Officials seeking to demand transparency from the Chinese government say they were explicitly told by colleagues not to explore the Wuhan Institute of Virology's gain-of-function research because it would bring unwelcome attention to the US government funding of it. Vanity Fair said that they'd obtained an internal memo by Thomas DiNano from the State Department saying that staff from two bureaus had warned not to pursue an investigation into the origin of COVID-19 because it would open a can of worms if it continued. So that suggestion might be seen to inform the sort of motivations that could have led that group that included Christian Anderson to be having a hurried meeting and then putting together a paper in double quick time to shut down public discussion. Vanity Fair also reported that in December 2020, at a meeting of a dozen State Department employees, Christopher Park, the director of the State Department's biological policy staff, told them not to say anything that would point to the US government's own role in gain-of-function research, according to documentation from that meeting. Park had been involved with lifting the US government's moratorium on funding gain-of-function research. It all gives additional context to how all of this has been playing out sight and scene within the various institutions. Now, in conclusion, we should note that notwithstanding the compelling evidence of bad behaviour, conflict of interest, organisational disinformation, that's all evidence of low politics. It doesn't add to the wholly circumstantial evidence currently in favour of a lab leak theory. I mean, I still think it's the most likely theory, but there is still a long, well-documented history of natural outbreaks, including ones where the intermediary host animals remained unknown for years. Well-hyped oddities in the SARS-CoV-2 sequence could have arisen in nature. What we've uncovered over the last six months isn't evidence about how the virus appeared. It's evidence that people with a vested interest try to shut down certain discussion. By all that we've seen, they did so because they feared where such questions might lead. They didn't do it knowing for a fact where they would lead. 
Regardless of what the truth turns out to be, even if we do find a trail pointing to a purely natural origin of this virus, how those institutions and individuals behaved is open to some seriously hard questions and should be the subject of an investigation. Thank you.